Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. And thank you so much for joining us on this Monday, the last day of February, 2022. Uh, we very much appreciate you being with us. And we hope that um, this will be an exciting one hour webinar for you on a groundbreaking initiative we have on the continent, on the African continental free trade area. My name is Sandra Masharia, and I am the chief of the Africa section here at the UN's Department of Global Communications in New York. And we are also the um, producers of Africa Renewal which is a UN digital magazine with several platforms where we focus on solutions oriented content and stories about Africa uh, and a narrative on Africa that is empowering, that is balanced and that is forward looking. And that is why I am just so pleased to hand over very quickly to Mr. Rafael Obonio who will be our moderator for the hour and, uh, and he will take us through the program. Thank you everybody. Thank you so very much, Sandra, for that very kind introduction and for the welcoming remarks. Uh, my name is Rafael Obonio, and I'll be moderating the session today uh, discussing the topic Africa Continental uh, Free Trade Area Opportunities for Young African Entrepreneurs. Many questions out there what is Africa and Continental Free Trade Area? Are youth ready? for the African continental free trade area, what opportunities are available for youth and how can youth uh, access uh, this, uh, uh, this opportunity? So those are the many questions that are out there. And in this particular discussion, we'll attempt to respond to some of these questions. To start us off, just to explain a little bit on uh, what African continental free trade area is. Uh, it seeks to create a single market, bringing together 55 countries. Uh, with a total population of about 1.3 billion people and um, a combined GDP of about 3 trillion people. It aims to increase intra-African trade, continent-wide trade, which has been historically low at the moment. I, I mean, just before uh, AF, uh, CFTA came into force, it was about 17%. And with this initiative, uh, it is anticipated that it will increase to over 50, 50%. With a median age of 19.8 uh, years, Africa is the youngest continent. Over 65% of Africa's population is under 25. And this population can be an opportunity, but it can also be a challenge. And especially if we look at uh, the fact that many young Africans are facing many challenges, including lack of employment, uh, unavailable, and in some cases, inadequate uh, financing for their businesses, poor infrastructure, uh, tariff and non-tariff uh, barriers to, to trade, and many, many other challenges that are youth, that uh, youth on the continent are confronting. However, the AFCTFA uh, is expected to catalyze Africa's industrialization and to address some of these uh, challenges, including uh, reducing poverty and creating jobs for the continent's uh, bulging uh, population. But the key question is how can the African youth participate and reap the full benefits of the trade, uh, of the free trade, uh, the African continental free trade area that has been, uh, has been created? As we may all be aware, and it is said, that uh, when people are informed, they get involved. So truly young people uh, want or need information that can enable them to participate meaningfully and effectively in the free trade, um, free trade space. And that's why, as Sandra did say, uh, UN Africa Renewal has organized this uh, uh, webinar to share information uh, that is going to enable the youth to participate more effectively and to reap the benefits uh, that are available or that emanate from the uh, AFC FTA. And so I want to welcome all of you, uh, wherever you are in different parts of the world, including Africans uh, in, the, in the diaspora, to this very important uh, webinar. Uh, we look forward to a robust discussion uh, and uh, act, your active, um, uh, active participation. 
There will be an opportunity for question and, uh, and answer uh, later in the program, and I'll give you a heads up. Uh, we are going to utilize our chat room, but I'm going to uh, share information about that uh, in a bit. So stay engaged and um, feel free uh, to share your thoughts, your concerns, and uh, your comments. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Joy Kategekwa. Dr. Joy Kategekwa is a strategic advisor to director for the Regional Bureau for Africa at the United Nations Development, um, Development Program. She served as the head of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, uh, where she led the delivery of um, the organization's trade capacity building uh, program across Africa. Dr. Kategekwa uh, is also an international trade law and uh, policy specialist with extensive experience in development of trade agreements. And I dare add uh, people friendly trade agreements. Uh, she's led uh, technical teams in drafting uh, the legal, I mean, she led the technical team, teams in drafting the legal negotiating instruments for the trade agreements leading to the establishment of the African continental free trade area. Uh, without much ado, it is now my pleasure and honor to invite and uh, give the floor to Dr. Joy Kategekwa, who is going to discuss with us our topic for the day, Africa Continental Free Trade Area Opportunities for Young African Entrepreneurs. Welcome, Dr. Kategekwa. Thank you very much, uh, Raphael, and uh, good afternoon from Nairobi. It's a pleasure to join you today to share my perspectives on how the AFCFTA creates opportunities for young people. Um, I'm from Uganda. I'm very Pan-African in my disposition. I truly believe in the power and the promise of this continent called Africa. And I come to this conversation very much as someone who's passionate about the role that trade can play in terms of advancing Africa's socioeconomic development. You know, if you ask what are the opportunities for young people, young entrepreneurs in the AFCFTA, I think the first question would be, why is this important? Why is it important? And then I'd like to talk a little bit about what is the meat on the bones when we talk about this AFCFTA? What is it concretely? Then how do we make it work, especially with young people? And what is your concrete problem there? So if we go back to why this is important, as a young, Ugandan girl going to school, primary school, I always recall classes about fluctuations in commodity prices. And because something was happening outside of the continent, outside of Uganda, somehow our coffee prices were tumbling, our export earnings were tumbling, and we could not meet the public services as we needed to. And I always, it always struck me, how can we be so not in church? And I always decided at that point that I will dedicate my time to understanding and trying to crack that problem. And over the years, I came to realize that it is indeed a problem that's related to trade policy. Why is the AFCFTA important? Let's think about African trade policy. African trade policy is structured around the possibility and the continuity of getting raw materials from this continent and taking them outside of the continent that they may add value, that they may create products, and that these products may be sold across the world, including back to Africa. Therefore, even if Ghana has these great intense um, endowments with cocoa, and you know, even if Mali, uh, Benin, and, and all these uh, C4 countries in West Africa are big on cotton, many times they're not at the final end of apparel. So you're sending raw materials and then you're buying back the final product. How does trade policy do this? It does it by attracting you to bring your raw materials by giving you zero tariffs. So you will pay tariffs, just bring those raw materials. It also does it by penalizing in a sense, your attempt to add value by increasing tariffs upward. And therefore you find that most African countries, it has not really been a question as to we do not want to add value. We do not want to industrialize. It's more that there is a tariff policy, there is a trade policy that makes it practical 
to send those raw materials and that penalizes you should you try to add value. And so the African continental free trade area is really trying to change that because behind that is the reality that African countries are exporting well, their will. African countries are exporting the prospect of value addition. African countries are exporting the value of industrialization. And so if you think about those value added points I've spoken about as the spaces where you create wealth, where you create prosperity, those processes for most countries that have advanced have to be done somewhere within the jurisdiction of a geographical space that you can control. I.e. you get the cocoa beans, you turn it into paste, you turn it into butter, you sweeten it, etc, etc, you end at the chocolate bar. That additive process is where you employ more people, is where you pull a higher price for your exports, and is where you get the development promise of trade-led growth. And so the FCFTA is trying to change this by making sure that between and amongst African countries, there is a tariff policy, a tariff structure that does not penalize intra-African trade. How does this, how does it do it? By those members that have committed to be bound to the provisions of this agreement, some 42 African countries that have ratified it now, by these countries agreeing that they will bring down those tariffs on 97% of their tariff lines. Imagine you have a tariff book that has all the specificities as to what you will charge. At this point, in terms of intra-African trade, it's true that there are preferential arrangements that are taking place in the regional economic communities, as we call them, so in ECOWAS, in ESC and SADC. But it's also true that pre AFCFTA, there was nothing that connects the continent so that East can look at West, so that North can look at South. And therefore, what the AFCFTA is trying to do is to bring down these barriers, knock them down to the extent of 97% uh, of tariff lines, so that if Ghanaians want to add value and create their chocolate bars, the Ugandans, like myself, who will be buying them and not imposing tariffs at the point of entry, should that line be part of the 97%. It's not just trade in goods, it's also trade in services. Because what the AFCFTA is saying, and we know services are important, because when you think about it, there is no production process of any goods that you can think of, that certainly I can think of, that does not have a sound, solid services component. And therefore, services are the glue that holds together production. And they are a sector in their own right that employs many people, that brings the diversification element, and that's at the center of this value addition question. When you think of transport, logistics, ETC, finance, and so on. And so the FCFTA says the following, that we shall give each other, us, the 42 countries that have ratified the agreement, we shall give each other preferential treatment that stops us from discriminating between and amongst each other to the extent or with respect to services and services suppliers. And when your services suppliers from another country come into mine, I am taking a commitment that I will not discriminate against them in preference for mine. So you can imagine what that means, that if Togo is taking on this commitment, it is saying when the Kenyans come to Togo, the Kenyan services suppliers, the lawyers, the engineers, ETC, when they come to my jurisdiction, I will treat them like Togolese. In the same way Kenya is saying, when yours come, I shall treat them like Kenya. It's really a question of treatment and preferential treatment. And therefore they're saying that in these five priority sectors, which we shall start with as a phased in process of, of opening the markets, we shall open, give each other market access, but also preferential treatment in terms of regulatory treatment. So you're talking finance, you're talking communications, you're talking telecom, you're talking finance, communications, transport, business services, and tourism. Now, this is changing the game when you think about it, because what it essentially does is it's opening the door for industrialization and it's opening the door for diversification through a services driven economy. Now, this in a sense answers two questions. Why is it important and what is the meat on the bones? So when you think about it, those two critical pillars of goods and services will go back to correct that first historical wrong I spoke about, which is the idea that intra-African trade pre afcft is penalized as a question of policy. And so when you open the door, when you lift the lid on this question of how trade within Africa can create something new, you start to see that we're going to go more in the direction 
of a made in Africa revolution. You start to see that we're going into the direction where you can think about goods and services made on the continent, hiring Africans, bringing skills, applying technology and moving ahead. An interesting point is that when you think about Africa's trade with the rest of the world, this point I started with with the cocoa beans, you will see a lot of raw materials. When you see the same story about Anna's cocoa with respect to intra-African trade, you start to see that it's not the beans they're exporting, it's the chocolate bar. And it tells you therefore that in the, in the context of intra-African trade, we're already starting to see value addition. We're already starting to see more technology applied to those production processes. It tells you that through this emerging pattern of intra-African trade, we're starting to see something that is structurally transforming and therefore putting us on a steady path to break that mold of poverty that development challenge that's actual. Now, how do we make this thing work? It's not the first trade, it's the first trade agreement at the scale of the continent, but it is not the first time African countries are trying to within and amongst each other in smaller constituencies have a trade agreement. All of these have created important progress. Indeed, when we talk about the 17%, the, the, the that's now a bit down to 15 or so that Rafael spoke about at the beginning, much of that is propelled from these regional economic communities. So something there works. But if we lift the lid on the problem or the tariff policy that's structured around extraction, structured around disintegration, when we reverse that and say we want a tariff policy that's around integration, we want a tariff policy that is around connectivity, as opposed to extraction, then you start to see that Africa indeed can go somewhere else. And that as it goes somewhere else, it takes Africans with it because to produce these goods and these services, you do need people. And therefore, how do we make it work? Here, I'd like to talk about two things. One is this question of implementation. The other is the question of utilization. So when you think about implementation, is this idea of the Togo Kenya example I gave. When you think about it, implementation, the track of implementation is about how the government of Togo and how the government of Kenya undertake a policy and regulatory reform agenda that makes that treatment promise a reality for exporters on the ground. And therefore this enabling environments question is critical that you must reform the regulations, you must indeed bring down the tariffs, you must streamline the regulations, you must deal with non-tariff barriers. If you've committed to services sectors X, Y, Z, indeed you have to put in place those measures, rules, regulations, administrative processes that ensure that when the Togolese is in Kenya, they can indeed enjoy that treatment. Remember I said, it's ultimately a question of treatment and preferential treatment. So that's implementation of the government. The second one is the utilization agenda. And this is this idea around the AFCFTA to work, we must put a huge foot on the pedal of utilization, i.e. what is in the market? What is on offer? Who is exporting? What are their capacities? What are their challenges? And how do we help them to overcome those challenges? I'd like to talk a little bit about a report that we put out at the end of last year, together with the AFCFTA Secretariat, the Futures Report 2021, which value chains from Made in Africa Revolution. I'd like to encourage you to take a look at that report because what the report does in essence is to tell us concretely what is on offer in this AFCFTA. 10 value chains emerge. When you think about it, we start with automobiles. We start with, when we go to lithium ion batteries, we go to pharmaceuticals, we go to leather and leather products, we go to clothing and apparel, we go to cocoa, we go to soya, we go to vaccines, we go to financial services, we go to uh, culture, and tourism, uh, culture, and, culture and tourism enabled services. And therefore you see a whole gamut. And this will take me to the last point, how do you get involved? How you get involved is to ask yourself, where do I fit into this story? I have seen there is an opportunity, there is a treaty, so it creates legal obligations. I have seen that there is critical, important progress done on the implementation agenda in the sense that countries have ratified. I have seen that a political decision and a decision has been taken as to start up trading. I have seen from the analytics emerging that these are the value chains coming out of it. How do I fit in? Do I want to be a producer of goods? Do I want to be a producer of services? Do I want to be part of a value chain X, Y, Z? Do I want to be an advocate on enabling environments? Do I want to be the one that pushes governments to make sure that this treatment they promise happens? Do I want to be a lawyer that is 
is, is, is preparing to adjudge those disputes that will arise? Do I want to be a jurist writing about this whole agreement that's emerging? Do I want to be teaching at the universities? The entry points for all of us, but the most critical is the following, that Africa's young people must seize the opportunity to take those decisions and those steps and those risks to make in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Dr. Kategeko. Well, that was quite insightful, uh, for sure. And uh, I'm sure I speak for all of us. Uh, we've gained quite a bit from uh, your presentation. Thank you so very much. I now want to open the floor for uh, questions uh, directed to Dr. Joy Kategekwa, since she's our sole guest speaker today and uh, based on her presentation and also just based on uh, some of the needs and concerns of young people on the continent. So feel free uh, to post your questions in the chat room and uh, then we are going to forward your questions or present your questions to Dr. Kategekwa, who is going to respond to our questions um, today. Like you've all heard, she's, um, she has the expertise, but she also has uh, extensive experience uh, on matters trade. And uh, she's been involved and she was involved at a very uh, high level in the um, negoci negotiations that led to the uh, establishment of the Africa continental free trade area. So this is the opportunity and uh, this is the right person at the right time to ask your quest any question that you have on uh, on um, on uh, on the topic. So to start us off, uh, I just have a few. Uh, I mean, two questions. Uh, Joy, this is from me as we wait for the other participants to to share their questions. My question is, um, what needs to be done in terms of policies and programs uh, to help young Africans? in different sectors to reap the benefits of increased um, intra-African trade. What really needs to be done? Because for sure we need certain enabling policies and programs. Uh, from where you sit, as someone who's been involved in this, uh, this process, what are some of these policies and what are the, uh, are the, are the programs? And the second uh, question uh, from me is uh, how and uh, when do we know that uh, this has been a success? You know, what are some of the indicators that will, uh, will, uh, will uh, basically highlight that uh, we are making progress, especially uh, with regards to, to youth on the continent, uh, realizing that um, youth unemployment is at a very high level, 70% of jobless people on the continent are actually, actually youth. When do we tell that uh, this, uh, this African continental free trade agreement is actually uh, succeeding. We are making progress with it as far as youth are concerned. So those are my two questions. And uh, of course, I will be sharing other questions from the participants. Thank you very much, Raphael. The, the first question is, is, is brilliant, as is the second one. But I think the first question is brilliant in the sense that you've delineated the distinction between policy and program. And I think we have to be in that mental frame where we understand that there are different sort of ways in which interventions can be made. So when you think about the policies and the policies for young people, I feel in a sense that young people have to take up the mantle, stand up and demonstrate that which they want. Because it won't be the first time that you think about, you hear about government programs for youth, for example or government programs on youth empowerment and so on and so forth. But the youth really have to think about it as something that's not going to be handed down, i.e. the opportunity has been created. What do you want to do with it? Because that internalization of what you want to do with it will lead to much more clarity then on the lobby work that you must do to advocate to ensure that that happens. Is it a question of enabling environments? i.e. that as you engage in export processes, you are facilitated and not decelerated? Is it a question of productive capacity that as you engage in the production of these goods, there are specific challenges you face? 
Is it about difficulty in meeting standards in markets ashore? Is it about financing that trade finance is too expensive and you simply have no access to it? So in a sense, it has to come down. And I think that would be the right approach that it, it shouldn't be a blanket. We have done something for the youth. It has to be youth positioning themselves, putting themselves center stage at this question of market, saying, this is what I want. I want to be able to access market X in that place Y and I'm producing X and I need support to take me to the next level. That, in a sense, should then trigger a programmatic response. And I think of the programmatic response, it's interesting because when you think about the whole idea of getting a product from conceptualization into packaging, crossing the border, mm -hmm. there's so much there that needs to take place. And it's a really important point because the way in which we've done trade capacity building over the years has not paid sufficient attention, in my view, to that question of how do you get me who wants to produce product X, who is producing product X to scale, to widen, to add value. And so it's, it, in a sense, we have to leave this space of what can be done to this space of this is what I have and I need to help me in this way. The second point you raised around um, what does success look like? That's a very interesting question because trade agreements and their implementation are an ongoing process. Now, throughout my years in, in, in trade law, trade policy, trade capacity building, 18 at this point, I have not seen anything at the speed of the AFCFTA. The political will, the technical processes, the push to get it through. And so that in and of itself is a success that you could get to that treaty point. The second point is the ratification at the pace at which it happened. The third point is that success must be looked at very much as the fact that Africa amidst pandemic, when people are shutting down borders and looking inward, is integrating, i.e. looking outward. That is success. Now, when you finish that chapeau, in the context of implementation, trade agreements are implemented through sound institutions. So when you think about it, the secretariat mm. and its capacity mm. to oversee mm. the process of implementation to make sure that the members who have committed to do X, Y, Z in tariff line X, Y, Z have actually put it in their schedules. The committees that oversee that, that receive um, notifications when treatment is not being provided, the preparation of institutions where disputes can be resolved, all of that implementation agenda and the institutional framework that's getting that together is huge because once you get that part right, you have the implementation right. Now, of course, we're all waiting for this idea of when is the actual trade taking place? We want to get there, we want to accelerate to get there. We're impatient to get there. Intra-African trade is taking place, even as we speak. You started off yourself with the 17%, but we want it to double. And so like you, I'm quite anxious to reach that point where it happens, but let's not discount the important role and work that's taking place in creating those critical enablers. When will it happen effectively? When you push for it, when you demand it, when you become part of that core that's actually producing these goods and these services and wants to get ahead. So then you get to the borders, you demand the treatment, and then we'll see what happens from there. So in a sense, this and that institutions are solid. We need to push the momentum. We need to continue in the enabling environment and we need to become part of that body of people that are working on the practicality of the promise of the AFCFT, which is really about production of goods and services. Thank you so very much, Dr. Kategekwa. I, I almost forgot that I was a moderator and I was taking notes. That is, uh, <laughs> it's quite insightful and quite helpful. But I also have questions. I, would, I mean, I have a couple of other questions, but I, uh, for now I have questions from the participants uh, who have joined in. And um, one is, uh, there's a question from Hulda uh, from Sierra Leone. Uh, and uh, Hulda from Sierra Leone is uh, posing the questions. Are there any plans to incorporate opportunities uh, for young returning uh, Africans, uh, entrepreneurs in the diaspora, like uh, Hulda. Uh, Hulda relocated back to Sierra Leone from California about two years back, and uh, have been uh, a silent observer of, uh, of the country and the continent as well. 
so the question is, uh, what are the opportunities for diasporians who are returning back to Africa? That's the first question. Uh, the second question is from uh, Claire Soriat. And Claire asks, uh, why, some country, why are some countries slow in implementing the new customs tariff? Uh, why is there hesitation by some countries to implement uh, the new custom tariffs? Uh, so um, we'll respond to those ones, and then I'll get back to you with a few more. And uh, um, they're quite, uh, it seems like people are quite engaged. I'm seeing questions streaming in. So yeah, and I just encourage all of us, if you have any questions, keep it uh, short and succinct, keeping, like they say, keep it uh, short and simple. Yeah, so uh, to you, Dr. Katagekwa, on the two questions. Thank you very much. And thank you to the colleagues and the, the young dynamic people on this call that have asked these questions. Let's start with diaspora. I think that the first step has been taken because you talked about a fact pattern where he was in, in, in the US, you said California and relocated back to Sierra Leone. You see, if you go back to where I started, the AFCFTA is really a promotion about make in Africa make these goods in Africa, because we are saying that that is where we keep a stronger hold on the development promise. In order for goods to benefit from the treatment that is provided, that is promised, that is offered in the AFCFTA, they have to meet what we call rules of origin. They have to meet the criteria that confirms that these products are indeed made in Sierra Leone for that, for, for that purpose, of our example and there's criteria that allows you to get there. So if it's agricultural products, okay, this maize is maize, this is grown in Uganda. If it is industrial products, then you have to start to understand because remember, if you do not have clarity on where the products are coming from, then you're not really keeping the value that is the promise of this agreement. So has there been substantial addition of an industrial process that increases the value of production of this product within the country, so we can say it's made in Uganda. Have you taken this product from cocoa, for example, the beans into sort of a paste, so you maybe change the tariff heading so that we can say, indeed, this thing is made in Ghana. This is very important because when you think about it, there's also a lot of possibility for transshipment. There's a lot of possibility for countries that have not taken on the obligations that come with the reform agenda to potentially free ride, so to speak, as they call it. And therefore the rules of origin are critical in ascribing who will benefit from that preferential treatment I spoke about. And so to answer your question from Sierra Leone, it, you're already back on the continent. It's about making those products, making those products, making them at a sufficient level of production process in country so that they can be given the treatment of the AFCFTA. And I think that that's, that's in a sense, you're guarding, you're guarding its development promise because you wanna make sure that those countries that have ratified have a prize for that, that, that responsibility they've taken up to ratify the agreement. Yeah, we yeah. also had a question around, we had a question around, uh, uh, wh why are some countries slow? This is a very interesting one. Countries always have to undertake their own assessment. Because when you think about it, when you sign on to these agreements, the intention is to be bound by their commitments, by their obligations. You reap the benefits, the processes, you enjoy the rights, but you must also take on the obligation. And so countries, I think there are different types of countries trying to manage how to deal with this. They're the weaker countries with less uh, industrial capacity, that are potentially thinking, what shall we be exporting? And are we going to have a flood of products into our country? And how do we deal with that? There's another set of countries that might be on the other side, which is they have a level of productive capacity. They have a level of market share. They actually do have exporters. And they're wondering, but what does this mean for the share we already have? And I think what I've learned over the years is that reluctance can be good. If reluctance is is, is taken to mean that window where countries are really trying to study, understand, analyze what to do. If the reluctant process is managed carefully, that's how you land at the best first 
or put differently, that's how you land at the best 3% exclusion. Because remember, it's developmental regionalism. We're still in a continent and in a space that must industrialize. Therefore, the pace and the sequencing and the ambition of the agreement has not reached 100%. Understanding that countries have to juggle different things. And therefore, if the goal is to better understand, better strategize, consult, because consultations are critical, it's not that sort of agreement to be successful where the negotiators go sit somewhere and you know tease out the legal issues and the policy issues and sign, you will go home and might get rejection from industry, you know, from the private sector. And so consultation is critical. But I think if, if the consultation process is complemented by high high powered advocacy that helps these countries, these players in the private sector to understand these governments who fear revenue loss, to understand what is in it for them over the long haul, to understand what is it in it for them in the value chains, to understand what the meaning of reciprocal preferential treatment means. Then you start to see that the doors start to open a bit more. Thanks. Thank you so very much. Of course, youth need to get involved. Youth need to get out of the waiting room. No one is going to do it for, for young people on the continent. They have to do it themselves. They have to engage in uh, advocacy, demand for more, and demand for better. A few other questions. Uh, one is from Timothy, and Timothy is asking, how does the AFC FTA plan to handle the price differences between imported goods and the domestically produced goods? since different countries have different costs of production. Another question from uh, Ezin Oswamadi. Uh, is there a current database where we can refer to, uh, where we can refer uh, to connect the diaspora in Africa? If not, I propose continental-wide database, a solution-oriented question there. Uh, another question is from Ifeanyi, Oguata. Actually, it's not a question. If Wanyu Oguata is from Nigeria, and uh, if Wanyu says a good day to everyone in the house, I'm writing from Nigeria. Very interesting program, and I do appreciate the organizers. Thank you so very much. I think this is to, to you and Africa Renewal. Young people are really appreciating this opportunity, this platform, this conversation, creating awareness and providing information on the African continental free trade area. There's a question from uh, Robert. Robert is from Kenya. And uh, Robert says, in Kenya, cancer and kidney failure, among other pollution-related diseases, is ravaging communities. Industrial activity and modernized agriculture involve the use of chemicals, some that are casino ca casinogenic. For instance, leather and paid industries. How can we balance import-export economies with regard uh, to environmental protection? Over to you, Dr. Kategekwa. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, let's start with Timothy. The question around imported goods, the pricing of imported goods vis-a-vis -vis domestic goods. And I think where you were going, Timothy, is how do, how do you deal with a situation where imported goods are cheaper than domestic goods and what do you do with that? When you do this, when you create these opportunities in these markets, you're looking for competitiveness. You're looking for opening markets and creating possibilities for foreign players on the basis of competitiveness. You're not looking at unfair trade practices. So you're not looking at the situation of dumping. And so in a sense, the AFCFTA has an annex that is precisely about those questions around anti-dumping and the possibility to countervail. So anti-dumping is, so dumping is really that practice where the price at which, the, the price at which the product is being sold in this export market, right? Does not, it does not really make sense given the production costs that would have been involved in producing that product. And so you find a situation where it is cheaper in this, in this context of the, of, of the market, the export market. And many times that of course means that it's also fighting unfairly with the products in the domestic market. So what the, what the anti-dumping annex does in that case is to require countries, state parties to investigate, to investigate through a competent, a competent authority 
on what this process is and how you're reaching at this pricing to ensure again that there is no dumping, there's no unfair trade practice. And once that is established by that competitive, that competent authority, then the finding would allow this country that is receiving these dumped products to countervail. Countervail, i.e. increase the tariff. So imagine that the product we're talking about was part of that 97%, so it's at zero. What this does with the possibility of countervailing is to raise the tariff so that you cushion that loss you would have got following the results of the investigation. That's one. The sec so, so basically the point is that within the legal framework, it is envisaged those, 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 those processes, those rules that can allow you to deal with anti-competitive unfair trade practices. And then we talked about a database. Is there a database? I think it's going to be interesting to think through, and I know many youth groups are already trying to engage with the secretariat. You see a team there that's dynamic. You see a team that wants to engage. I'd encourage you to think through how you can engage with the secretary and find out what the information portals they have, especially for young people. At UNDP, we're also keen to work with young people. Last year, we hosted quite an interesting fireside chat where we're talking precisely about how to make the AFCFT magic work for young people. And you have these young, dynamic people that really see it as an opportunity to seize a market. I think how it's worked, where it's working successfully is where you have young people who are taking the mantle and going ahead and demanding to be seen, demanding to be heard, demanding to engage. And so I encourage you in that sense to, to, to hold the reins and move in that direction. And then there was a question around, around what we call sanitary and phytosanitary conditions. So when you export a product, in order for a country to import it, it must fulfill certain conditions. Mm -hmm. Some of those conditions are sanitary, phytosanitary, others are related to technical barriers to trade and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that question you, you, you spoke about um, around this question of cancer causing uh, products and the things that are used to boost agricultural production, countries have conditions, have standards that must be met. And so the standards authorities of these countries would set those standards. What the AFCFTA does is provide a framework, a framework in which the guidelines and the guidance that you will be looking at. So you're looking at protection of plant health, for example, protection of animal health, protection of human health. And so this is very critical because it means that even as you start to produce this product, that's where I was going at the start to say, what, are, what is your skin in the game and what challenges are you facing? So imagine one of the markets in the FCFTA has imposed sanitary conditions, standards that you find that you find complicated. Of course, they'll have to justify them based on those criteria I've given. Is it protecting plant health, animal health, and so human health, etc., etc. But should there be situations where the feeling, the view, the, the perspective of the exporters is that these standards are being misused, then you also have the possibility in these committees that are speaking about in the institutional framework to address these issues as a matter with a view to trying to resolve them. And of course, ultimately, if you fail, there's always that channel also of dispute resolution. And then a final point around exceptions. All of these agreements have what we call general exceptions. I don't think if it is proven that indeed these, these products are dangerous to, to, to human health or even animal health, etc. I don't think any country can be forced to have to take them. Now, of course, it's a question of case law. It's a question of investigations. It's a question of science. It's a question of proving um, you know, the complexity of the toxicity and all of those things, as you can imagine, but all to say, that what you're pushing for in these trade agreements is trade in safe goods, tra trade in goods that are safe for human consumption. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to meet those standards that are indeed in conformity with that. That is why the standards agenda and the capacity to meet standards agenda is going to be critical for the, the exporters that want to benefit from the AFCFT. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kadegekwa. They have uh, I mean, a few other questions here. One is from uh, Hudson, who is in Nairobi, Kenya. And Hudson, uh, Hudson posts the question, what are the major opportunities for entrepreneurs whose work are related to environmental and climate issues? Uh, young entrepreneurs who are engaged in, um, 
um, initiatives related to environment and uh, climate change. What are the opportunities for them? Then there is a question from Jacinta Kagai. Jacinta Kagai is a vibrant gender equality champion uh, on the continent. She's from Kenya. And uh, Jacinta's question is, uh, how do we address the gender-based violence at the border points uh, and harassment towards women and young women across border traders, especially the small scale traders? Uh, then the other question is from Julius Dakpo. Julius Dakpo is from Liberia. And Julius is asking what opportunities are available for financing, especially for young entrepreneurs. And like we did say at the very beginning, financing for businesses, especially for young entrepreneurs on the continent is a big, big challenge. And so Julius is asking, what are the opportunities uh, for financing, especially for young entrepreneurs? Over to you, Dr. Ari. Okay, thank you very much. So let's start with environmental uh, questions. What are the opportunities for environmental for those engaged in climate and all of that. You will recall when I was doing the, when I was concluding in the first intervention, I thought, I said, there's a chain, there's a whole basket of opportunities and, and you have to think about where you get in there. There are those who will produce environmental goods and services, which is interesting, which is niche, because as we move in this direction of goods that are produced off renewable energy, for example, or goods that are produced in conformity with production process X, Y, Z, you will find that ultimately, as the market gets much more sophisticated, perhaps those will continue to be niche products that can attract markets. And by reverse, perhaps, as you move into that direction, that maybe those that are not would suffer the consequences of that. So there is a possibility, I think, to create niche production processes in environmental goods and services. But remember, I also said, even if the production of these goods, which are ultimately what the treatment is about and services, even if that's the most important, there are other things. So when you think about, I spoke about trade in services and I spoke about business services as one of the sectors that have been prioritized the first five. When you unpack business services, you start to find professional services in there, you start to find consulting in there and so on and so forth. And so to the extent that you can position yourself as providing those services as an independent service supplier, as an independent professional, as a contractual service supplier, that sort of thing. I can see opportunities in that space as well. And then when you talk about, there, there are also many opportunities emerging in my view as to how to ensure that the entire gamut of the AFCFTA is, is being implemented in a, an environmentally sound manner. And so you find that some people are positioning to do analysis and to do ex anti type sort of understanding of how can how much of environmental concerns we're taking into account in framing these agreements and what does it mean down the road if implementation is not done in that way. So I'm saying all of these things to say your creativity is your limit. Everybody uses their toolkit. I'm a lawyer. So naturally we, I'd be thinking about the aspects that are entry points for those with legal training and trade law, for example. If people are producing products, that would be their entry point. If people are researchers and analysts, that would be their entry point. If you're an advocate and you're insisting these products must be made you know, in environmentally sound processes, that's your entry point. You can't get any of these entry points well if you don't understand the breadth of what's on offer. And therefore, I think it's important that these conversations carry on. It's important that these young people continue to engage the secretariat, most importantly, continue to engage their governments. So there was another question from Jacinta around gender-based violence. We spent last year together with UN Women and the AFCFT Secretariat, holding, facilitating national consultations on women in trade. The understanding is that at some point in the near future, they will be launching a protocol on women in trade because women are saying, well, this agreement is great, but we don't fully see ourselves in there. We need something dedicated, something concrete. And the heads of state have taken a decision that indeed there will be a protocol on women in trade. And so it was interesting the request UNDP got because what we were requested to do was to in a sense find a new, contribute to a process that creates a new way of doing these trade agreements. Because typically governments send their represent representatives in the foreign affairs or trade or other uh, they sit in these negotiating fora, they, 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 they battle out different parts of texts and so on and so forth, of course, consult with, with, with the stakeholders at home and so on and so forth. And then you come up 
with this treaty. But what they're doing in the context of women in trade is very interesting because they're saying, no, no, let's go to the women first. Let's hear them out. Let's understand what they want. And so last year, UNDP, UN Women, AFCFTA Secretariat, we conducted 26 consultations in 26 African countries, national dialogues. Next week, we're having one in Uganda. Women in trade, what is your view? And this issue you raised, Jacinta, came up. The question of how trade facilitation is engendered, whether it is focusing enough on the unique issues women face as they engage in cross-border trade. Now, when those issues are raised, the next question is solutions. So let me go back to how the AFCFTA, as is now, deals with these situations. You have an annex on trade facilitation. And this annex on trade facilitation is gender neutral, but it pushes for a process that is smooth, that is streamlined, that allows for three main baskets of ideas. One is that you have freedom of transit, so the goods are moving. The goods must move if they're in transit that you streamline questions around fees and charges, that the fees and the charges that you're putting on my, on my exports as they cross your borders should, be, should not be a tax, because remember we said zero tariffs. So they shouldn't be a tariff. They can be approximated to the cost of the service rendered, but that's not the same as a tariff, right? And then the third point they're trying to do in trade facilitation is really to say, let's have transparency. These, these rules, regulations that, that affect how my goods will be crossing, let them be clear, let them be transparent. Don't change them willy-nilly. Give us an understanding, give us an opportunity to comment, give us clarity, let it be in languages we can understand, etc, etc. Now that in and of itself is a very important contribution. When you come to the second level, the women in trade protocol and what it could potentially address, I think there is scope there to start to think about what specific measures can be put in place to support women in those contexts. Some have spoken about establishing women desks, these cross-border points. So there is, it's almost like you have these authorized women uh, traders or you have a special, a special facilitation point where they are facilitated to move. You also have something interesting that works in the Comisa area, which is what they call the simplified trade regime, where exports below a certain threshold are in French, we say laissez passer, you let them go. You don't take them through the rigor because maybe the threshold $2,000 is, is, is really low. So just let them go. So what is a simplified trade regime for the AFCTA? I invite you to read the Futures Report 2021 because there you have a fascinating account from one of the ladies who's one of our leading experts on gender and trade. And she tries to tease out precisely what a pro-women trade facilitation agenda could look like. Julius, um, opportunities for financing. You remember someone asked the question earlier around what policies and what programs. I think you have to demand these things. And I think the first protocol would have to be the governance. Because remember, the products will be made in a state party. So it's almost like the Ugandans must be routing for the Ugandan products that will hit that African market. That means that we have to do the lobby work at home to ensure that the governments are attuned to those enabling environments, which include rules, regulations, but also financing and so on and so forth. And then of course, there are many interesting regimes that are emerging to support financing or, uh, for those who are engaging in cross-border trade. It's not directly to the question you, you, you've raised. For example, a recent initiative of the Africa Export-Import Bank uh, the Pan-African Payments and Settlement System is an interesting one because what it does, it doesn't give you financing, but it saves you financing in the sense that they're trying to create possibilities for intra-African trade to take place where I give you my shilling, you give me your nira. And so we cut out that 5 billion that Africa uses annually in correspondence intermediary banks and in, in exchange rates and that sort of thing. And so in a sense, you, there are many interesting, um, how do you call it, initiatives that are taking place to ensure that you're stimulated to engage in FFTA by keeping as much money in where it needs to be, which is to facilitate your production process. But the practical question of the money, the credit lines and so on and so forth, I would say that that's a lobby point, especially first and foremost for the government. We have a minute left and then, and then we close. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so very much. I wouldn't do justice to wrap uh, to summarize to try and summarize the points you've uh, you've uh, you made. You've made it uh, eloquently and articulately. We really, really, really appreciate. There are still so many questions coming in, but of course we have very limited time, uh, Dr. Katageko. And I think this is a request to UN Africa Renewal. Uh, first is a sign that truly young people appreciate uh, these opportunities and opportunities like this, and so we should continue with these kind of uh, initiatives and we hope we'll, uh, we will uh, have another forum to also continue engaging Dr. Kategekwa and other guest speakers that uh, you, will, uh, you will invite. So for, for now, I just want to thank all of us, um, all of you participants for your active participation and for your uh, engagement. This has really been ex exciting and uh, the conversation was quite um, quite robust. Thank you so very much, Dr. Kategekwa. Uh, we really, really appreciate for eloquently explaining to all of us what Africa continental free trade area is, what opportunities are available for the youth, and also challenging the youth to get involved, to take action, to seize the opportunity. I think that is extremely uh, important and this, that, that there are myriad of um, opportunities in the free trade space and uh, that people should step forward, young people should step forward and take advantage of um, uh, these opportunities. Many thanks to the organizers, the Africa section uh, of the UN Department of uh, Global Communication. Uh, I am in, I'm informed that the events, there are many other events that are coming up uh, I hope we'll all be able to participate in such um, future events. Please be on the on the lookout for more information on Africa continental free trade area. Uh, there is an African renewal podcast that has just been posted in the chat room. Please uh, pick it up. And uh, they say it is highly informative. I encourage all of us to download it and listen to it. It's been prepaid, so it is free. Don't pay for anything. All you need are just bundles. Mm -hmm. You can also follow Africa Renewal on Twitter and uh, on Facebook uh, at Africa Renewal. Uh, yeah, and so you can remain engaged. And you can also, of course, uh, follow Dr. Kategekwa on a various social media platform uh, so that you can, you can continue to imbibe in uh, insights and, um, and expertise. This brings the webinar to an end. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day, wherever you are. Thank you so very much. Thanks to all of us. And um, good evening, um, good afternoon, good morning, and a wonderful day, wherever you are. Thank you so very much and see you next time.